Evening all. Celebrations for Magnus Carlsen overtaking Kasparov's all-time rating. We're still a bit qualified after Magnus's win against Levon Aronian because Kasparov's actual live rating historical record uh, was about two five, sorry, two eight five six uh, point seven or something. So it's between two eight five six to two eight five seven, and so Magnus. In his next game after that win in round three, drew a game against Kramnik. And so we reach the fourth round where Magnus now was paired against Garwin Jones. So who could he actually still try and beat Gary Kasparov's highest ever real time FIDO rating, not the published rating, but the real time rating, which was about two eight five six. So Carlson really needs to get over that 2856 point if he could win this game. So let's see what happened against Gwen Jones. Gwen Jones. E4 from Magnus. Sicilian defense. Gwen Jones chooses. Knight f3, d6. And we see a natural move, very popular. d4. After c takes d4, first big surprise of the game. A good move, but not the most popular beaten track. Queen takes d4. So again, evidence that it's not just the beaten tracks which are the most used by the GMs, but they'll try other systems. They want to get some surprise value in the mix, get the opponents to improvise more on their own resources, less theoretical, and some interesting, more complex imbalances to manage. If people are improvising, improvising, if opponents are having to improvise beyond their own resources, will they manage the elements of the position? Will they manage the position effectively? We see the move a6 here, which seems to be designed uh, to stop the bishop b5 pin, because knight c6 is a nice developing move with tempo, if it wasn't for bishop b5. So a6 is basically saying, I'm going to get a tempo on the queen. Now Magnus's next move seems to me quite amazing actually because I don't remember seeing any other game like this uh, recently. Okay, and it's like we're almost in new territory. I should really do uh, a reference check. I'll, if I click the reference tab on my, my, my chess base light database just to see on this light database what has been happening here. It's preparing a search for this position and uh, searching, searching, no games found. <laughs> okay, what about for h3? There are lots of games from this position and the move c4, Moroxy bind indication is very, very popular. Checking the notation like Popov Milev for example, is, is one, one game which pops up from 1950. Uh, if we go in reverse chronological order in this position um, on this light database, well, okay, some good players have been playing this, mostly with C4, to be, to be honest, from this. H3 I just can't find. So C4 is the most popular move. Bishop E3 is another move. But H3, it just looks quite surprising to play h3 it's it's uh it's not on the list here bishop g5 has been played 71 times no 416 times before bishop e3 559 times but c2 c4 the Moroxy buying construction 1301 games here best players kasparov nihua nidich playing that okay so let's go back to the game so we see the move h3 we must already be outside of Gwen's territory. He must be on his own resources here, surely. And he plays what seems to be a totally logical, natural move. Just kick the queen, get some development in. The queen now goes to e3. Why e3? Well, maybe it does support e5. It does block in this bishop, clearly. OK, the Roxy Bind can still be played with c4. And in fact, after g6, it is played c4. Will this queen be a tempo gainer? Well, not to a knight f6 to g4. That's one idea, maybe of h3. That the queen is parked relatively uh, without penalty of tempo gains. 
bishop g7 looks like a a very logical dark square strategy put pressure on the dark squares bishops potentially very handy okay and it seems to be attacking this pawn here uh, as well pardon me which is protected by the bishop so this bishop can't play bishop d2 and knight c3 the queen's also useful for queen takes c3 no structural damage will result from queen e3 as well so that's another perk of queen e3 okay so we see bishop e2 fair enough knight f6 knight c3 both sides now castle okay and now black plays knight d7 what is a problem with black's position here potentially and what are the assets well if black wants to play knight c5 maybe the move a5 will have to be played but that weakens b5 if b5 is weakened and the knight goes to b5 what about d6 what about this d file the default file seems to be in white's favor pressure on d6 point could be painful for black longer term for the moment white now plays rook b1 although as though there's a real interest in actually playing b4 here and this is now prevented at the cost of the b5 square black playing a5 queen not minding the b5 square weakness here okay with the queen now on e3 one perk mentioned is the c3 protection and that's made use of now with b3 okay so white's development is kind of natural now where is this bishop going to go after the knight c5 we see the move bishop b2 actually as though there's an interest in exchanging off the dark square bishops and maybe the queen on e3 can also be useful after the exchange to come here if this is removed so it makes a lot of sense this queen e3 move in conjunction with h3 and this seems to be relatively new territory to play that move h3 especially but uh, with transpositions maybe there are a lot of other games as well with this setup it seems quite nice now black's next move did seem to generate here a lot of play especially for these bishops they seem to be enjoying this position already but this bishop is of course deprived of the g4 square but it wants maybe the f5 square for this diagonal so this next move seems very nice f5 if black can get in f4 that would be a very nice dark square grip surely then maybe the e5 square will be nice to use or even later try and play for g5 even so i think f4 needs to be prevented there's also pressure on e4 and maybe you know a threat of taking on c3 potentially but usually it would be uh, very dangerous for the dark squares <laughs> so that's usually ruled out but uh, okay magnus in this position he plays e takes f5 now unless one unless black wants to hem in his own bishop he wants to keep the bishops active he plays bishop takes f5 and there's a question here about activity and how effective the activity is although these bishops seem to be very active are they actually very effective they they are complementing each other here the rook is asked to move it goes to a useful position rook bd1 eyeing the sensitive d6 square okay and that d6 pawn is kind of pinned on the d file so pressure on c5 later from a minor piece such as bishop h bishop a3 will be useful but okay this is no longer protected so knight d5 is now ruled out surely to bishop takes b2 this is a real pin now and black plays another active move in this position he's really activating all his pieces to the full he plays a4 and at this point if you're a casual unbiased observer and didn't know who was playing who you might think well black looks really good here surely these bishops are very active the knights look well placed a4 looks quite dangerous as well undermine this structure it all looks fairly logical magnus's next move relies on this d file pin he's got a chance now to play bishop a3 which he takes advantage of so he's threatening bishop takes c5 without that being able to capture but another aggressive move from black queen a5 hitting the knight sorting out the c5 issue 
However, in this position there is a tactical possibility, perhaps, of playing b4, which we need to investigate, because taking and then knight d5 hitting the queen and a knight e7, it's interesting. We need to investigate that in the second pass. In this position, Magnus moves the knight out of the way and simultaneously guards against a b for the bishop being loose. This is a nifty move. Threatening now, bishop takes c5 also, winning a pawn. Okay, so is the position not as good as we might have imagined earlier? Black plays a takes b3 here. a takes b3. And guess the move here. <laughs> what move do you think Gwen Jones played in this position? If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, it looks pretty stunning this next move. Maybe Tal will be proud. Queen takes a3. Queen sack. <laughs> Queen sack for two minor pieces? Outrageous, you might ask. Outrageous. What is this nonsense, you might think? What is going on here? Two minor pieces? We're talking three for bishop? Or 3.5? And three for knight? If you don't like knights so much. Six and a half versus a queen? Nine or ten even, if you're optimistic with a queen. So what is going on? But what about this pawn now? Is black threatening to win another unit in the form of this pawn? Well, if the pawn is protected, it comes at a downside. If it's protected, surely the d4 square. Black can use the d4 square and get even more, more peace activity. But what else? Black's ruling out rook b1. A passive move needs to be played here though. B3 needs to be protected surely, otherwise other things are going to be nasty now for white. So Magnus does take time. I'm not sure what else he can do in this position. There's a forcing move G4 which seems pretty hopeless. Nothing's really that easy to attack at the moment, so he plays knight D2. So black for the moment has an interesting initiative two pieces for the queen and he's got the d4 square from the weakness of the last move we can see black can use the d4 square for something interesting black chooses to play now bishop d4 there's not too many places for the queen to be um, not able to be harassed the queen actually goes down to g3 and it's harassed again with bishop e5 but now it can be Defended with f4 at the cost of weakening the diagonal, though. This diagonal. So, some sort of concession has been achieved here by white playing f4, but is it enough for the queen? Bishop f6. Giving white a move now. What can white do with the move? White creates a concrete threat in this position. Plays bishop g4, threatening bishop takes f5. g pawn pinned. Black answers niftily with knight d4, basically saying if bishop takes f5, I'll fork queen and king. Don't you dare take on f5. And b3, more pressure on b3. If black can win another pawn, things will be looking up. The move king h2 is played. Okay, so what is going on here? Black doesn't perhaps want a self pin by taking here. Maybe taking on f5 would lose that piece. The knight is pinned to the rook here, laterally. So that bishop takes f5 is still a useful thing. Black tries to get rid of that and attack an, another another attack now with bishop c2. So there's a lot of pieces attacking that b3 pawn. b3 is going to drop, surely. Does it matter? Magnus plays rook d e1. And now. Black is not too keen to immediately take on b3 by the evidence of the next move. King h8 is played instead. Giving Manix the time to add a bit more support to the b3 pawn. 
but maybe this move ha has other functional values rookie free basically maintaining a pin on a3 would be enough if black did dare take on b3 so this b3 taking b3 comes at some cost to black maybe he's not too interested in it just yet another forcing move from black on the other side of the board now h5 the bishop really hasn't got too many moves in this position but bishop d1 needs to be considered it seems fairly logical it's it's indirectly fending off b3 but that wasn't played no magnus chooses another continuation a forcing move b4 double attack on c5 and a3 okay now in this position there are various possibilities for black which I think we need to check out in the second pass I think most notably knight d3 is very interesting it is supported by bishop and rook knight d3 is technically possible and then it might be quite dangerous uh, for white after that but um, the game continuation looks dangerous as well but might not be as good as knight d3 the game continuation another forcing move Black has to spend the forcing moves very carefully though. They might not be ultra effective or as effective as they possibly can be. And in this scenario, the forcing move h4 is played. Okay. Two places, three places for the queen. You might think these are unattractive. What about knight d3? Well, what other plays? Queen h2? Surely outrageous. It's not the Nimzovich overprotection immortal game with a queen on h2. Magnus, for the moment, plays queen f2, not minding another tempo gainer with knight d3. But this is a slight difference. If the other route had been taken for knight d3 first, then this next move wouldn't have been available, surely. This next move that Magnus plays is parks his queen right back at base next to the king on g1 okay <laughs> strange play you might think from someone who's just uh, uh, got one of the highest ratings in the world for the queen to be part next to the king here learning black seems seemingly very aggressive position two pieces for that queen is has white created a kind of coiled spring this bishop though is now nice on the diagonal it's not interrupted by h5 it hasn't been asked to move back it's just been left there on that diagonal which has some functional value and in fact this functional value is demonstrated at this very moment uh, but what is what is white threatening as well what what actually does black have to deal with in this position that that's one question maybe bishop d1 for example is a kind of threat okay but um, we'll check that out in the second pass what the actual threats here are black plays knight f5 which creates more threat like knight g3 check it seems annoying and attacking the rook of course and the bishop takes on f5 you might think hang on a sec this is more counterplay for black along this g-file isn't this getting a bit dangerous this g-file so Magnus takes sorry not Magnus <laughs> Magnus is playing white going takes on f5 with the pawn maybe looking forward to rook g8 now and we've got a kind of good looking knight on d3 for the moment but this knight is pinned to the rook it's not as functionally glamorous as it looks glamorous so knight f3 now okay introducing some interesting possibilities it also defends against bishop d4 skewer as well okay rook c3 is played and Magnus is not ready to give up the pawn on c4 just yet judging by this next move c5 okay and tactically if takes take rook takes we can see I think rook takes d3 and the Queen's not so helpless on g1 as might 
use as you might think. Black now plays bishop b3, an intensely complicated position, and I look forward to the second pass of this game. And now this pin is used here. It's still there's still a pin, and it's made use of with knight e1, allowing the skewer though. And that's made use of bishop d4, skewing rook against queen. But uh, is this good for black? Magnus just takes on d3. He doesn't mind about rook takes d3. He can gladly give up his queen and remain the exchange ahead. With equal on pawns, the exchange ahead. If rook takes d3, just rook takes d3. Bishop takes, king takes, exchange up. Thanks very much. So maybe this isn't very nice for black. Black plays d takes c5 instead. Magnus plays queen f2, still offering rook takes d3, but still no interest in that from black. There's also this pawn to consider. It's loose with check. Black plays rook f7. Is this pawn too dangerous to take here? Rook h7, then carry on. Magnus is not interested in this pawn at the moment. He just plays now. The move rook c1, saying, OK, if you're not going to take on d3, I'll challenge you, and the knight's protecting c1. Here, black goes for the dangerous looking pawn with c takes b4. Magnus takes on c3, giving black that dangerous looking pawn. But then another reverse gear maneuver from the queen. I wonder if you can guess it. Well, there's a bit of a clue there, reverse gear. If I give you 10 seconds. OK. I think let's play queen e1. And now it becomes apparent that actually, hold on a sec, bishop takes, there's also queen takes c3 check. There's now a threat of rook takes e7 as well. Queen h4 remains useful potentially as well. But is c2 dangerous? Let's check this final position because this was the final position of the game. Black resigned here. And with Black resigning, by the way, Magnus overtook Kasparov's all time real time rating. Magnus became with this win 2857.4, making history in terms of beating the all time highest recorded. FIDE live rating, i.e. after individual game rather than the tournaments, rather than the published rating on a published list, 2857.4, beating apparently Kaspar even Kasparov's noted maximum real-time rating, which I believe was 2856.7. OK. And that, I believe, was after beating Anand, but uh, please correct me if you, if you know which exact game that was, that Kasparov reached his all-time peak real-time rating. But yeah, congratulations to Magnus. And let's try and work out why Black resigned now. Let's put on the kibitzer. OK, what happens if c2 in this final position? The knight's guarding c1, so take e7. Let's take e7. Big problems. What can we do? If we take here, it doesn't look too hot. We take here. Black tries to desperately queen. We just casually take here. End of game. It looks pretty hopeless. Uh, so that doesn't offer much resistance. Um, plus nine. It does look plus nine generally. Uh, if nothing else, there's knight c1 as well. Just offering an exchange. That that'll be okay. Attacking the bishop. Check. Would win the bishop here. Where else can the bishop move? That was a bit silly for the bishop. If it moves there, there's check. D5, there's check. Where else can the bishop move? That's pretty hopeless. <laughs> so uh, it does look pretty hopeless here. Um, the best move is actually what I mentioned. Bishop takes e3. If we go for bishop takes e3, queen takes e3, winning this bishop on b3 or offering the one on d4, does it matter? Either one can be taken. Well, it's queen versus rook. It's, it's quite easy, it seems. So it's pretty hopeless for black. Plus seven. So let's go back. Very interesting opening. I think Black was thrown onto his own resources ruthlessly with this game continuation, this innocuous h3 move, which seemed to work exceptionally well with queen e3. 
you know, engine, does it like H3? Does it mention H3? Does it mention the book move, which is usually C4? Are the engines interested in creating Meroxy binds in the opening, as human players are? Human players tend to relish the Meroxy bind, especially in this kind of variation. But no, there's no interest from an engine for a Meroxy bind. Okay. But H3 is also, there's no interest in that move either. So knight c6, queen e3. We see g6, and now c4 engine is liking c4 for a moment there. Bishop g7, bishop e2, knight f6. For the moment, okay, let's get past what looks to be getting the pieces out. So we see the move rook b1, which the engine liked. Small advantage with rook b1. a5 looks a little bit of a concession, really. But the engine likes it. It doesn't matter about the b5 square here. There's other important things going on. b3, afforded by the queen's position. Not liked much by the engine, to be honest there. Other moves, well. But b3 has a certain uh, logic to it. Why not? If the knight's protected by the queen. So knight c5, and we saw bishop b2 here. And now this aggressive looking move, f5, which the engine doesn't mind, either f5. So, so far, it looks as though Magnus has uh, confounded the engines yet again by having this position, which offers an absolutely minuscule kind of advantage. So what is Magnus seeing that the engines are not, or other people are not, from playing such an opening? Visually, black has activity with these bishops, bearing down on position and control of d4, a little bit of control of d4. And with a4 on the cards as well now, rook bd1, we see the move a4, which the engine flicked through just then. I'm thinking about other moves now. So maybe there's something not so hot about a4. It's coming back to it now. Why not? Why not a4? Okay. So we see the move bishop a3, which actually is a just-in-time move, you know, just-in-time for bishop c5, otherwise a, b. Just-in-time opportunity to attack that knight while the queen's on d8. Knight a4 looks like pawn fragmentation on the cards. Let's have a look at knight takes a4 out of interest. Knight takes a4, takes, takes check nothing much in it for white fragmented pawns maybe c5 okay it's, it seems okay actually but uh, completely different games let's go back so two paths here to take taking on a4 or bishop a3 is played bishop a3 is also quite liked by the engine here bishop a3 Depth 18, bishop a3. Okay. So we see the move queen a5, and here is where the advantage crept up quite a bit actually with queen a5. And there's immediately the move b4, the tactical move, which seems quite tempting actually. Let's have a look at that. b4. If takes, takes, we have a forcing move here, knight d5. We can take on e7. We can take on f5, get rid of black's bishop pair strategically. And White seems to have a promising position here. This may be a continuation uh, Magnus surely examined. Does Black have knight e4 protecting d6 though? Knight g5. Still seems okay if bishop h6. I think we've got knight f7 check there, if nothing else. So, okay, it's a different game. It's a different game. b4 was avoided. It's a sharp move, but. Uh, we see knight b5 instead, which actually the engine doesn't like at all compared to b4. Big difference. And why? Not because of the game continuation. Rook f6 is is potentially interesting here. And the mechanism the engine's relying on, I believe, is bishop takes c5, rook e6, interposing rook e6 before capturing to fend that e pawn. And this should be should be okay for black. It's, an, it's a nifty looking position. Look at these bishops. Look at the rook. 
the knight controlling d4 queen's offered there I think it's okay um, okay but no we see now this this uh, towel like continuation again rook f6 is, is an interesting idea to be able to say rook e6 because it's, it's defending that c5 pawn if black like takes on c5 that's that's terrible I think because of just queen takes c5 so if black has this resource here in this position of rook e6 that's okay you can then take on c5 without losing that pawn that that's it's looking like an aggressive position for black doesn't matter about taking a queen it looks okay black looks to be okay more than okay really but in the game we we see the tell like continuation after a b we saw amazingly queen takes a3 computer says no <laughs> plus 1.4 so why does the computer say no okay let's check knight takes a3 rook takes a3 magnus has moved knight d2 defensive necessary or was it or was it queen g5 what is going on with queen g5 as an alternative offering b3 queen h4 fret now knight g5 we look at threat analysis surely nope not really just having the queen on h4 is generally useful okay that's interesting just offering b3 and be done with it but no Magnus plays knight d2 which looks good as well bishop d4 queen goes to g3 if it went to f3 then it's running into bishop c2 surely or even stronger bishop d3 bishop d3 well, I would have to give give up the queen here. It's not too too nice. Although it's still quite tempting. Um, but um, okay, no, the queen is not ready to give herself up. Queen g3 is played, and it's kicked again. And now we see the move f4. Okay, and the bishop goes back to f6 here. Which might not be as good as the check. Get the tempo, you might think. Get the tempo, but does it improve the king's position? Rook a2. Not much in it. We're talking here. Depth 14, engine. Not seeing too much in it. So black has play. That's what it means. Black has some counterplay here to be dealt with. So it's not going to be an easy ride with that sort of evaluation in theory. But in the game, okay, we saw bishop f6. Now bishop g4, other moves are also interesting, bishop f3 for example, but here this bishop g4 is not too bad, knight d4 it seems, in terms of valuation. Now this looks like a blunder almost, knight d4. Did black have better, because that valuation went up, bishop d3, for example attacking the rook, bishop c2, now not taking on b3. I think taking on b3 is a mistake because of rook e3 or even rook b1. Okay. But rook a2, it's all a bit complicated and murky this position, surely. So let's go back. Bishop g4, we saw knight d4, and it seems black slipped up slightly for some reason. King just moves. So really avoiding that knight e2 little trick. Tucking the king away. Bishop c2. The rook goes to e1. White's advantage is, is becoming more pronounced somehow. Why couldn't black take on b3, you might ask, here? Takes, for example. In this position, knight e4, just making use of that pin, just threatening knight f6, maybe. Takes, takes. Rook d1. Knights look fragile. If this knight moves, that drops. Oh, bishop e6 tactically here. Black's on the back foot here, losing one of those knights. Doesn't look so convincing here, the queen sack. Okay, so let's let's go back. Black played king h8. And then we saw rook e3. So b4 is a major threat in this position. Uh, if knight d3, knight f3. Okay. Black played now h5. 
And in this position, it seems the engine really likes bishop d1. So what is going on here? Magnus played b4. Is bishop d1 actually at all stronger? Let's just quickly check this out. Bishop d1 threatens taking and then knight and then rook e f3. Okay. So if black well if he if black takes rook takes g8 g6 was I'm pleased that b4 now knight f5 rook takes a3 this this looks interesting this line where white's uh, the exchange up and it shouldn't be too much uh, difficulty here for a player Magnus's uh, class to win this equal on pawns okay so that that's interesting so bishop d1 seems seems an interesting alternative uh, it's the only square really the bishop can go to uh, well f3 and e2 as well but then uh, maybe b3 is an issue if for example bishop f3 then black might even be better with knight f5 almost uh, or is it going to be a petrol check? But anyway, so in this position, um, b4 was played here. So was there an opportunity for black to improve? Because it seems h4 is not so great as knight d3. We saw in the game queen f2 to g1. So what about knight d3 here to stop the queen ending up on g1? And trying to reserve h4 to push the queen here. Is that better? Let's see, does it make much difference? Bishop d1, let's go knight f5. Is that one of the stronger moves? h4 here, there's actually queen takes g6. That's okay, offering the queen like this. This is very, very complex. Check, exposing an attack on the queen. Bishop takes g6, rook takes a3. White should be okay here as well. Uh, so it is a very difficult position for Black, really. So knight d3 liked a bit better, but um, bishop d1. If Black hasn't got better than knight f5, uh, then there's a problem. Or h4, queen g6 h4 queen takes g6 okay so maybe it didn't make too much difference in in the game b4 was played immediately and uh, this gave the queen now f2 for g1 i mean the queen from h2 to go can go to g1 anyway if we look at this does it really make that much difference knight d3 here We, we just quickly look at this again. If h4 here, if bishop d1, h4, there's queen h takes g6. I mean, maybe even queen h2 is is possible or not. No, this this is pushing it. Knight f5, and black m might actually be clearly better here. Okay, so no need for that. So in this position, queen takes g6 is a very powerful move just relying on this pin on the rook on a3 I guess uh, that might be why it was just played immediately so just playing that immediately so we get queen f2 knight d3 queen just parks on g1 here and yeah the engine likes white's position here even though it looks looks a fairly passive retreat uh, what can black concretely do here? What is white actually threatening? If we do a threat analysis here, knight e4 or rook takes e7. Rook takes e7 is one of the f hidden threats because of taking and queen takes d4 perhaps. Um, but knight e4 as well is interesting. So a difficult position for black. Um, so knight f5 was played here. 
and now Magnus just took knight f3, this pin is just very awkward here rook c3, at least the rook's protected on c3, this bishop let me sort c5 maybe other moves are technically better, this looks a bit weird to play g4 but but so uh, what white has the queen um so rook takes i mean let's, let's see what what could black do here just queen takes g4 the queen comes out menacing threats like well not not quite knight f2 but um threats like queen h5 check maybe if given another move and then rook g1 okay so that's that's interesting as well uh but Megan's played uh, c5 bishop b3 Knight e1 using that pin on the rook. Bishop d4. Magnus not minding just being the exchange up. So knight takes d3, strong move. Rook takes d3. Um, wasn't played immediately. Instead, we saw d takes. Which gives this, this move, which uh, is really liked now. Queen f2, it strikes at h4 potentially. Um, so forcing something to be done about h4 or is there another threat as well that's the main one um, okay so rook f7 rook c1 now was played white's just uh, doing very well and in this final position just uh, queen e1 is a strong move as well it's just uh, Winning for white without too much resistance, it seems. Okay, uh, so with this win, uh, Magnus overtook Sparf's all time real time FIDO rating, and according to 2700chess.com, uh, became 2857.4. So I think we're looking at. Uh, nearly one point threshold on Kaspar or maybe more than one point threshold threshold on Kaspar's all time rating of which I think was two eight five six point seven. Um okay so maybe okay le less than point well mate less than point in it. But it's it's still a historic event. Uh, no one's ever done that before. So it was the it was the brilliant results of, of Colson in this tournament and this this win pushed him over okay to break the all-time real-time rating okay hope you enjoyed it comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much